Jupiter's moon Io has to be one of my favorite objects in the solar system. That might be quite a statement to some. After all, we have Mars, Europa and Titan, which are all much more interesting than the pizza moon, right? I'd majorly beg to differ on this. When Mars, Europa or Titan are brought up as the most interesting objects in the solar system, this is often in context of the potential prospects of finding life there. But as I hope this series will continue to prove to world builders, dead bodies can be interesting too. And when it comes to dead bodies in our solar system, Io, at least for me personally, takes the top. And it's not even close. Hello everybody and welcome back to Project Espa. My name is Yiji Online and in this series I document my process of world building my world Espa. Thus far in the series we have made a trinary star system with a sun-like star in the center. We then put three planets in orbit around it. A Kundor, a scorched small magma planet, Sulkin, a corrosive sulfur world where it rains sulfuric acid, and most recently Manta the system's main Jovian Shepherd, over twice as massive as Jupiter. We also planned out a sextuple moon system for Manta, which brings us to today's episode, which will focus on adding the first moon to that system, Ideme. While Manta is plenty old as far as the history of this project is concerned, it took me till 2017 to design a moon system for it. While there is this one moon in the 2016 Celestia version I made, clearly minimal effort went into its design. And in 2017 I remodeled the entire ESPA project into Space Engine, which was new and awesome at the time. And I remember going around to procedural moons in version 0.972 to find the first draft of Manta's moon system. After a little bit of tweaking, a little bit too much I might add, lo and behold, Ideme was born. It was an atrocity. This initial version had so many problems it makes me cringe. Don't worry my little moon, your long due makeover comes today. Not only was Ideme's mass about 10 times what should have been realistic, because Manta was less massive in this version, resulting in a pretty much impossible density of 19 grams per cubic centimeter? Jesus. I also gave it a nice dense atmosphere to justify a nice temperature of 1 degree Celsius, to in turn justify large surface bodies of water. L listen, I don't know what 2017 Yiji was doing, but it gets even worse from here, because I decided I would love it very much if these oceans appeared red, so I came up with the brilliantly realistic idea of saturating them with cobalt bromine. <sighs> yep, out of all options I could have gone with to make red oceans. Cobalt bromine. So then I added a 0.7 bar atmosphere of 20% chlorine. Listen, clearly I was mostly concerned with the color aesthetics of this moon more than the actual realism of it, which is a terrible way to world build. But hey, at least it was tightly locked. So thumbs up for that 2017 me. While later versions would try to patch out the most critical issues such as lowering its mass, making it colder, and replacing the cobalt bromine oceans with just methane oceans, this entire moon is just so systematically broken but the only thing I can like about it today is its name, Ideme. Okay, so now that I have explained to you why old Ideme wasn't very good, let's set some goals for how we can redo this ground up and be more realistic. First of all, we do actually have the base parameters of our moon set out already from the last video, so that saves a lot of time today. Like I explained in the last video, these are extremely intertwined with the values of the other moons in the system, so it's good we already have them calibrated. I absolutely want to base Ideme on Io and make it a tidally super stressed world. Io is the coolest object in the solar system after all. It's an irradiated tidal world which almost fits the role of Ideme like a puzzle piece. I 100% am gonna add an Io, but we have a great opportunity to supercharge it and make it even more extreme. And everything for this is set up right already to put this moon under tremendous tidal stress. Firstly, its parent is two and a half times as massive as Jupiter. Second, its orbit is almost 100,000 kilometers closer to this parent. And it's in a longer resonance chain, resulting in truly insane tidal forces. Why would I do this to my moon, Ideme? Because Io is awesome. Let's also do away with the idea of it having seas. Looking back, I really don't see the need for the extra hassle to make those work, and it will provide less specific demands from the atmosphere and temperature that way. Don't add surface seas if you don't have to.
Let's start off with some math. What actually is a tidal force? To put it scientifically, it's the difference in gravity over a difference in distance. Imagine an object in orbit. The body itself is the point, but has a diameter of sometimes thousands of kilometers, meaning one part is more distant from the parent's gravitational pull than the other. As distance changes, so does the amount of gravity with which the parent pulls on the object. This difference in gravity is the tidal force, which can be calculated as follows. Running this formula finds that the tidal force upon Ideme would be about 32 millinewtons per kilogram. Now that may sound very small, but for context the tidal force of the Earth upon the Moon is only 24 micronewtons, and on Io, it's 6 millinewtons, which means Ideme will experience 5 times the tidal force Io does. This is a truly immense tidal force, which will shape Ideme dramatically. Io is awesome. Let me say that one more time. Io is awesome. Due to the intense tidal forces upon the moon, its geology is forced into a perpetually active state where it otherwise would have shut down long ago. Despite being extremely cold and without an atmosphere, the tidal forces stretch, bend and heat the moon, causing massive volcanism and geological activity. On Io, tidal heating produces about 100 quadrillion watts of volcanic energy, over 20 times of all the volcanic energy on Earth. This has ravaged the moon's surface with volcanic activity. Over 400 known active volcanoes constantly reshape its surface. The moon's entire surface is so dynamic that it has been said making a map of Io is a fool's errand. While this is a bit of an exaggeration to say about Io, on Ideme, this has the potential to be very accurate. Ideme would be hypervolcanic with larger and more frequent volcanic activities, which would erase surface features on timescales of years or even months instead of decades. The surface would be in such constant dynamic flux that even high frequency observations would struggle to keep up, making Ideme a truly volatile environment. Ideme would be under constant and extreme tidal stress, causing the whole body of the moon to be deformed by tidal forces, which generates tremendous amounts of heat and geological stress. Despite the great distance to its star, these forces cause Ideme's interior to melt and form hot silicate magmas. On Io, the whole upper mantle may be a subsurface magma ocean, but on Ideme, this may include the lower mantle too. Remember when I said in the Akundra episode that tidal heating really doesn't do much? Well, it all depends on scale, of course. With Ideme, if we run the same formulas, we can approximate that tidal stress warms the moon almost one degree. That won't sound like a lot, but actually it's a huge number given the context that bodies usually don't even break a hundred of a degree in tidal heating. Which goes to further show how extreme this moon's orbit is. Because Ideme is locked in this extreme tidal tug of war, it generates an immense amount of eternal heat which can only escape from beneath the surface through volcanism, resulting in thousands of active volcanoes dotted across its surface. Huge lava fountains going up many kilometers, sometimes even spouting directly into space. Large lava lakes the size of some countries on Earth, and with hot basaltic lava flows spreading out over large plains. The volcanoes found on Ideme would dwarf anything found elsewhere in the Ojoran system. Ideme would thus be permanently locked into an Hadean environment the Earth escaped from billions of years ago, looking more like the planets did over 4 billion years ago than any modern terrestrial body. Ideme would definitely be one of the most colorful objects in the Ojoran system. With the moon's outer crust made of many layers of basaltic lava and sulfur snow, the surface showing fresh, dark silicate lava flows and red to beige sulfur frost, while explosive eruptions tend to leave dark rings or halos that consist of basaltic pyroclasts, more effusive eruptions tend to leave red or orange sulfur deposits. Since it would be very cold on Ideme, 177 degrees below zero, it means that when volcanic sulfur gas is ejected, it will freeze and turn to sulfur snow. The snow, settling on hot, fresh silicate lava flows, forming a wonderful spectrum of colors. 
fresh lava flows start out almost completely black. But when they cool, they will first go from black to green as the sulfur reacts with basaltic minerals, forming a kind of pyrite frost. As the emplaced basaltic lava continues to cool and age, they slowly disappear underneath sulfur snow, turning red, orange and later yellow and then ultimately white until a new lava flow comes along. While on Io in this spectrum yellow is the most dominant stage, on the much more active Edeme this will shift towards orange, due to new lava flows generally happening quicker before the spectrum is completed. Yellow would still be common though, with the moon showing both yellow and orange regions clearly visible from space. Edeme, much like Aya, wouldn't have much of an atmosphere. But not much doesn't mean none at all. There would be significant volcanic outgassing after all. Since the moon is too cold and has too little gravity to hold on to much of these gases, they wouldn't stay around for very long. Instead of an atmosphere, it would have what is known as a surface-bound exosphere, which would steadily leak away into space. However, Edeme's replacement rate for its atmosphere would far outpace Io's, generating orders of magnitudes more pressure. While that would be the case, it still wouldn't be dramatic though when compared to the Earth, maintaining a geologically decreasing pressure at around a few microbars, let's say four. In composition though, it would be very similar to Io, being mostly composed of volcanic gases. Sulfur dioxide and sulfur monoxide would make up about 99% of the atmosphere, with salts such as sodium chloride and potassium chloride, as well as trace amounts of elemental sulfur and oxygen created through photodissociation filling up the remainder. Well, you read the title, but yes, with Edeme so close to its Jovian parent, it would be located deep inside Monta's magnetosphere. This generates an intense amount of radiation, which is very difficult to precisely estimate, but let's try by comparing it to Io's conditions. We know Monta's magnetosphere is about seven times as powerful as Jupiter's, which would create both stronger and denser radiation belts. With Edeme's distance to Monta also a lot closer, this would scale the effect up even more. When volcanoes on Edeme eject plasma, it charges the radiation belts further. The only thing that really puts a cap on this process is the solar wind, but while the Mentonian system is closer to Ogre than the Jovian, Ogre is a weaker star than our sun, so this would mostly cancel out. With all these in consideration, a conservative estimate would scale the radiation on Edeme 2 to 6 times that found on Io. This could translate to a suffering 140 sieverts a day. To give some context to this number, on Earth there's a background radiation of just 2 millisieverts a year. Edeme would get over 25 million times that dose. Just the dose of one sieverge is enough to cause serious health risks, and the maximum dose of radiation received during the Chernobyl disaster was just 16 sieverts. Edeme would consistently get about 9 times that amount. I will craft the monster. A radiation dose of 140 sieverts a day is catastrophically high. It is nearly four times higher than that of Io's already lethal environment, and thousands of times the fatal dose for humans. Such an amount of radiation would affect the looks of the moon significantly, irradiating and discoloring the sulfur snow from yellow and white to red and brown. If this body existed for real, no unprotected life or conventional technology could survive on the surface, with even the most robust extremophiles or electronics destroyed almost instantly. This is one of the harshest radiation environments conceivable outside a star or nuclear explosion, and as such, it may take Espen's very long, even well into their space age to explore this moon up close. That said though, this dose is an estimation, and not an exact calculation, because that would be an immensely complicated process to get a precise value for. But if anyone knows of a more exact way to estimate this, just let me know in the comments below. One wonderful effect of all the radiation though is the intense aurora Edeme would enjoy, even though its atmosphere is very trace. While on Earth, auroras are caused by the solar wind, on Edeme they would be caused by Manta's magnetosphere. While solar wind auroras are centered on the poles, magnetosphere auroras occur around the equator. Due to all the volcanic gases in the atmosphere, Edeme's auroras would be mostly red, unlike Earth's green auroras, extending high into the moon's exosphere. Thank you. 
Didyme is the first Mantonian moon, having a mass of about 80% that of our moon, and a size of just over 3100 kilometers in diameter. It orbits the giant at over 300,000 kilometers every 17 hours and 21 minutes. At this distance, it's under immense tidal stress, which perpetually melts and breaks the moon, causing unseen levels of volcanism. Idime, as a result, resembles more of a Hadean era world than a modern moon. Explosive and effusive eruptions regularly reshape its surface and eject large amounts of volcanic gases into its trace atmosphere. Due to the cold temperature on Idime, which is 170 degrees below, ejected sulfur compounds freeze to snow and settle on the fresh surface being dark red initially and slowly fading to orange, yellow and then finally white as they age though it rarely reaches this stage before a new eruption covers it over. Due to Idame's tight orbit as first in the resonance chain, it's bombarded with 140 sieverts of intense radiation, which discolors the surface snow into disgusting red and brown hues. A further effect of the radiation is deep red aurora spread across the moon's equator instead of the poles. All the while, Manta looms in its sky 50 times larger than our moon, creating a stunningly hostile, irradiated, tidal hell world. Io is still the coolest object in the solar system, and Idume never needed to try so hard with cobalt bromine oceans ugh, to measure up. Making moons is tricky because they are so interconnected with each other. But I think today we did a great job on Idume. I'm happy with it. So that then brings us to the comet of the episode. Because Manta's orbit is just exterior to Espas, it might have an effect on Espas' eccentricity. Nothing too crazy, but you'd expect Espas' eccentricity to be more of an influence on the seasons compared to Earth. Thanks for your comment, and that's certainly true. The Ojoran system has no Mars between Espa and Manta, which is going to have some notable effects on how Espa interacts with the other bodies in its system, particularly with Manta. This is something I'm saving for later though. While I could rush through the Ojoran system, I really want to detail it out, so that I have all the necessary context to make Espa just as detailed. So we'll get back to this in due time. So make sure you're subscribed if you want to see how Project Espa continues, and leave me a comment telling me what you think of Idume, since I really enjoyed making this one. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one, where we're going to the second moon of Manta, Tora. Stay tuned.